mercado laboral ha sufrido profundas transformaciones a nivel mundial desde el comienzo del siglo XXI. La fragmentación de las cadenas de producción alrededor del mundo, la pérdida de industrias en los países avanzados, el ritmo acelerado de desarrollo tecnológico, la incursión laboral de los millennials, estos y otros factores han hecho que el trabajo se haya transformado de manera radical. Frente a esta realidad compleja, existen voces que intentan descifrar la dirección hacia donde vamos y en el camino, ofrecer algunas ideas para mejorar la experiencia laboral de las nuevas generaciones. A la vanguardia de este movimiento está Jacob Morgan. Jacob Morgan es hoy nuestro invitado en La Era de las Definiciones. Hola, ¿qué tal, amigas y amigos? Muy buenas noches. Nuevamente con ustedes y primero muy agradecido porque nos siguen prestando su atención, siguen viendo este programa, porque nos sigue llegando correspondencia y porque de alguna manera está gustando estos diálogos con personajes, con celebridades que buscamos en todo el mundo para traer cosas interesantes, novedosas en este mundo de cambios profundos, frecuentes, rápidos, casi cada minuto del día hay cambios. Today, most top celebrities and relevant people throughout the world, they are young people. And today we're going to have Jacob here with us, which came, and I thank him, to visit Centro Fox and to speak about his uh, so many, many issues and subjects that he uh, is very uh, expert on. So, uh, Jacob, thank you very much for being here for with having. us. And uh, as we were talking before, we're going to try to get from you part of your curricula, your life. Uh, let's just start with uh, you were so international with the place you were born, your parents, where they came from. Please, let's start right there. Oh, man. So uh, my family history, I think, is pretty interesting. <coughs> they were born in the Republic of Georgia. Uh, actually, my grandparents came from Ukraine, um, but my mom and dad were both born in the Republic of Georgia in Tbilisi. Uh, they lived there for a long time, and they didn't actually know each other when they lived uh, in the Republic of Georgia. But then they, they migrated to Italy as refugees. They left the Republic of Georgia, they went to Italy, and they actually met in Italy, which is interesting, both as refugees uh -huh. when they were migrating there. Um, my grandmother actually introduced my parents together. And then, so from Italy, they moved to Australia, uh, and Australia is where I was born. And we moved to the United States when I was two months old. What kind of activities did your parents have when they were in Italy? Did they start from zero, from scratch? Oh. And then they moved to Australia. What for? A job took them there? Yeah, so they, they started with nothing. Um, in fact, when they left the Republic of Georgia, everything was taken from them. They had to actually Um, sneak some of their valuables in the handles of a knife um, because everything was taken from them when you, when you left the Republic of Georgia. All your money, all your possessions. So they had nothing. I mean, they were literally refugees. They didn't speak English. They didn't speak Italian. They only spoke Russian and Georgian. So they were coming to America without knowing anything. And in Italy, they basically had a choice. Do you want to go to the United States? Do you want to go to Australia? And I think uh, Israel was maybe another option that they had. And they decided on Australia. So, because they had some distant relatives that were in Australia, uh -huh. so that's where they went. And they stayed there for a little while, and my dad has always heard about America, the land of opportunity, and he was really, really passionate about that it. That little while was surviving? I mean, um, yeah. or he got a job or worked for somebody? Or what? Yeah, so my dad... I'm trying to, to discover on one side the difficult life of migrants, but on the other side, their courage, their strength, their power within yep. to come along, to survive. Yeah, my dad was trained as an engineer. So he went to school st uh, and he studied to be an engineer, an aerospace engineer. And so that's what he did when he got to Australia. In Italy, they didn't really have many jobs there. Okay. They were just kind of refugees there temporarily. But the rest of my family, they washed ditches, they worked in, um, they cleaned the bathrooms, they did whatever they could to, to, to make money. Okay. My grandfather drove a taxi. Uh, he was also a 
famous musician in the Republic of Georgia. He played the cello, he was in the orchestra. Wow. So he tried to, he, he led the, the chamber orchestra in the Republic of Georgia, and then when he got to Australia, he was in the orchestra there as well. But for a while, they did whatever they could to make money. Yes. Um, they did literally anything that they could do to, uh, to survive. And um, it was like that for many decades before they were finally able to move up, so to speak. And my grandmother taught uh, at the Naval Academy in Australia, and she taught a lot of diplomats English and Russian. She helped them understand how to um, deal with Russia. Uh, my dad was an aerospace engineer there. My grandfather became one of the leaders of the orchestra there, and they eventually grew and, and built their life. In the United States, when we moved here, my dad What, had a, what uh, years are we talking about? When moving from Australia to the United States. So this was in the early 80s. 80, yeah. early, okay. Yep. So the very early 80s. Uh, I, was, I was born in 83, so in 83 is when they came to the United States. And they had a very hard time. My dad would always tell me his, his first job, he didn't speak English at all, so he learned how to speak English. He used to watch the Johnny Carson show, and he used to watch it, and he had an English to Russian translation dictionary. And as he would watch the show, he would look in the dictionary to try to understand the words that Johnny Carson was saying. And that's how he taught himself how to speak English. And it's really, you know, when he tells me these stories, it's very hard for me to imagine, right? Because I grew up in the, in the world of, of Facebook and technology yeah. and the internet. So for me, thinking about um, learning a language, by, I mean, it's just amazing, the, the, the the journey that my family and many other immigrant families yes, and refugees yes. have taken. It's just, it's absolutely amazing. It pales in comparison to some of the challenges and issues that I'm faced with today. I'm traveling across the planet um, mm. and, and to get these kind of jobs is amazing. And so that's how he learned to speak English. And he would always tell me these stories of how, how hard it was for him to get a job. And every time he would go to a job interview, the person who was interviewing him would always say, okay, we'll get back to you in two weeks. Mm -hmm. And he told me one time, he lived, uh, I think, in, in New Jersey at the time. And he went for a job interview in Los Angeles. And he came all the way to Los Angeles for the job interview. And when he got here, he was told, oh, the person who's interviewing you is on vacation. So you need to come back later. <laughs> and he said, what are you talking about? I flew across the country. I don't have any money. I came here for a job interview. And so he had a lot of those types of situations. And one day, he went for a job interview, and the person said, okay, we'll get back to you in two weeks. And my dad said, no. You interviewed me, you talked to me, tell me right now if I got the job. I don't want to wait two weeks. And the guy put his hand across the table, and he said, congratulations, you got the job. Okay. So the person who was interviewing him was the president of the company. And he liked that my dad was just, you know, tell me if I got it or not. And that was his one of his first jobs in the United States. And then that was the kind of the starting point and it all grew from there. Yes. My mom was a computer programmer. She mm. did that for a long, long time. She worked for a big insurance company. And she didn't like her job. I mean, I would remember um, many nights my mom would come home crying because she was so unhappy with her work. And so she made a mid-year or mid-life career change and went back to school, got a master's degree and became a therapist. Wow. And so that's what she's been doing for the last few years. Uh, and that change. she loves to do. Yes, she loves to be, to, she loves to be a therapist. She's that's one of those. A, a great lesson. I mean, we all should look for the place where we enjoy what we are doing, where we really like it, and then our performance is much, much better. Yeah, I completely agree. And today my dad, you know, he commutes an hour and a half to work, hour and a half back from work, and he's... He's who I would describe as kind of the ultimate workhorse, right? He, he loves to work and he's just like, you know, he's kind of like that car that you have that, that keeps running yes. and you have the car for like 30, 40 years and it just keeps working and keep, that's, that's kind of like my dad. Okay. Now, uh, so now you were born in the United States, you are a U.S. citizen. Melbourne. Mel in born Melbourne. in Melbourne. But uh, early you came to the yes. States. And uh, you went to school in the States. Uh, yes. Tell me about that. Basically, the high school, college, university. I was always a terrible student. Um, I didn't like school. In fact, to this day... <laughs> but you went all day in the school. Yeah. It was, years and years. I, <laughs> yeah, so I was in school for many years. And to this day, 
sometimes I still have nightmares about school. I still have nightmares sometimes where I'm supposed to turn in a project and I forgot to do it. So that's, that's how much like school has traumatized me. And I, I was just never good at school. In middle school and high school, my um, grade point average was like a 1.8, 2.7, which is, you know, C minus or a C, it was terrible. And I was only good at two subjects. I was always good at uh, physical education and I was good at uh, drama. I liked acting. Okay. And so those were the only two subjects that I was ever good at. And after high school, I went to community college. And in community college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. First, I thought I wanted to do computer science. Then I thought I wanted to do marketing. Uh, I, th I thought I wanted to do all these different types of things. And even in community college, terrible student. But I was lucky that my grades were good enough to get into a university. And when I got to university, I went to the University of California, Santa Cruz. And when I showed up to school there, I realized that this is kind of, this is it. If I don't do well here, I'm never going to get a job. So I studied a lot. I lived on campus while all of my friends were partying. A lot of the times I would spend in the library. Like I, I mean, I had fun too, but I, I studied a lot. And I graduated with honors with a double degree in economics and psychology. And I was very proud of myself. I thought, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into this great company and one day I'll become the, the chief marketing officer of like Coca-Cola or something like that. And my first job out of college was in Los Angeles where my family lived. And during the interview process, they said, you're gonna be traveling the country, you're gonna be meeting with executives and entrepreneurs, you're gonna do all this really amazing work. And I thought, oh, perfect, like I'm so glad I worked so hard in school. And so I took the job, and a couple months into my job, I'm doing data entry, cold calling, PowerPoint presentations, and one totally day... Totally different than what they have told you. Totally, totally different than what I was told. Um, and this happens a lot, by the way, to people yes, today. Yes, it happened to me in Coca-Cola. Oh, really? Well, it happened to me in Ford Motor Company, that I thought I was going to be traveling around and doing exciting things. And they enclosed me in an office, and I was there eight hours a day. I had to wear a tie, and so I said, forget it. And I moved out and then went to Coca-Cola. Wow. But yeah. go ahead, please. It's, it's a, no, and I'm actually really curious to hear about that, too. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a common problem that we have, um, which I can talk about yes. in a minute. But so, yeah, I was told I was going to be doing all these things, and then data entry, cold calling, PowerPoint presentations. And then the, the big pivotal moment for me was when the, the CEO comes out of his office. And he screams across the whole office. He says, Jacob, come over here. I have a really important project for you. And I got very excited. I thought, this is it. Like, this is it. You know, we're going to do something great. And he calls me over. And I said, yes, what is it? You know, these big eyes are so excited. And he says, I'm late for a meeting. I need you to run to Starbucks and get me a cup of coffee. And get, <laughs> and get yourself a coffee as well, is what he said. And he gave me $10 and he said, go get me coffee. And I remember I was thinking, are you crazy? Like, this is why I went, I worked so hard in school is to get you a cup of coffee. Yeah, go get your own cup of coffee. Uh, of course, I didn't say that. That's kind of what I thought on the inside. But I said, of course, yeah, no, sure, no problem. I'd love to get you that cup of coffee. And that was one of the last full-time jobs I've ever had working for anybody else. And ever since then, I've just been very interested in understanding how the world of work is changing and how do we build companies where people don't have those types of experiences? Right. You know, uh, this, this reminds me of uh, also something I say about leadership. There's a time in life where you, where you have something, an event, or something that happens that it brings you to reflect if you're happy with what you're doing, if, uh, if you, it's if it's what you wanted, yep. or just take your decision. And then, and then I see that you, uh, that moved you to a totally new life. Yeah. And I think it's very important, uh, this concept of being uh, happy with uh, your job, with what you're doing, uh, that brings you to a much higher performance and much better results, and, and, and more so to happiness, at least to enjoy what you're doing. Yep. But. Uh, we have to go to commercials now. Sure. We'll come right back. Sounds good.
Actualmente las economías avanzadas a nivel mundial están inmersas en una profunda transformación económica. El sector industrial, por mucho tiempo el principal empleador, ha perdido peso frente al sector de servicios. También la polarización laboral va en aumento y los trabajos para los que se requiere un rango medio de competencias y cuya remuneración es también mediana son cada vez más escasos. En el origen de ambos fenómenos se encuentra el desarrollo tecnológico. Por ello, es fundamental que los trabajadores adquieran habilidades digitales. Según estimaciones, más del 50% de los adultos de los países desarrollados son prácticamente analfabetos digitales, pudiendo realizar tareas básicas como navegar en Internet y enviar correos electrónicos. Bien, aquí estamos de regreso. Jacob, now you are to a new life. <laughs> What happened from there on? Because it became very exciting and, uh, and it's been to, to us that uh, your knowledge, your books has really inspired and has really given us an outlook of what's coming uh, in the future. But let's start with this new job and how did you come up to where you are today? Sure. Uh, so interestingly enough, we were talking about job happiness. I was happier. I used to work at Whole Foods. Um, it's a grocery store. I was happier working in a grocery store before I went to college than Uh, than I was with the jobs I had after college. So that goes to show the types of companies for some reason that I ended up working for. Um, so after that, I had, a, I had a college roommate that I went to school with. His name is uh, Brian Aragon, actually. And he, he lived in the Bay Area in a town called Alamo, not too far away from San Francisco. And we would always talk, you know, after college, I would have my, my terrible job I didn't like, and he would tell me about stuff that he was doing. And we talked on the phone, and he said, you know, it, we, we came up with this idea of, wouldn't it be interesting if we both moved into San Francisco and tried to get jobs there? And I thought, oh, that's crazy. You know, I don't know anybody in San Francisco. And he said, well, my family lives near San Francisco. Why don't you come live with us for a little while, and we'll both look for jobs in San Francisco. So one day, I took all of my clothes, threw it in my car with all of my stuff, and drove up. From L.A.? From L.A. And my family said, oh, you're crazy. It's the most expensive city. Like, what are you, you know, you know my parents were very worried. They thought I was losing my mind. <laughs> so I threw all my clothes in the car, all of my stuff, and I drove up in my Nissan Maxima to Brian's house. And I think I lived there for probably two, three months. And then we both looked for a job in San Francisco. And I found a job there, and he found a job there, and so, and so we, we moved. And we got an apartment there, and we continued to live together. And he worked for his company, I worked for my company, and we would both, every day, wake up at 8 o'clock. I would walk to my company, he would walk to his company, and I hated my job. Every morning I would wake up, and I would think, oh, my God. Like, I, you know, I would get that feeling in my stomach of like, oh, I, I don't want to go to work. And I had a similar experience there where people just told me what to do. You know, nobody cares about your opinion. Just shut up and, and do what you're told. And um, after that, I started finding jobs online. So while I had my full-time job, I was also looking for jobs on the side, on, on websites like Craigslist. And these were marketing jobs. Um, I was doing search engine optimization at the time, which is how do you get websites to rank higher in Google and, and Yahoo, et cetera. And so I would try to find these jobs on the side. So I had a full-time job and I had side jobs. And when my side jobs made enough money so that I could pay my rent, I quit my full-time job. Mm -hmm. And from there, really, I used social media to build a personal brand for myself. So over the past 10 years, I created a blog where I wrote about stuff. I became active on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn. And I was just all the time just creating content and building and building and building. So similar to the way that you, you build a house, you know, with your hands, you build a foundation. I was doing that online. I was building my digital house. And for many years, I would just create content and I would speak at conferences for free. And I would just be everywhere I could possibly be. Subject, issues that you so were the, dealing with at that time? At the time, it was a lot of um, marketing. So this was, this was before Facebook was popular, before Twitter was popular. 
it was, uh, it was doing online marketing stuff. Okay. And at the time, social media became popular, so I naturally gravitated to social media. And I started to write, uh, write a lot about how to use social media, um, giving advice on Twitter and Facebook, uh, videos, stuff like that. And then after that, the next stage was a lot of companies were using social media inside. Things like um, you know, internal collaboration tools, internal social networks, just for the employees. So then I started writing about that and talking about that and speaking about that. And then it became more on the future of work. So it just kind of evolved and evolved. Mm -hmm. But I'm a big believer in fake it till you make it, right? So the, if you were to look at my life sort of in, in detail, you would see I wasn't making much money. Uh, I didn't have a lot of business contacts. And I was just kind of this struggling young kid. And you did not have a, a defined plan or project. Nope. Yet you were moving, looking for something. Yep. Constantly moving around. And, you know, my friends knew. They said, oh, you know, Jacob's not working for anybody, but it doesn't look like he's doing that well. You know, I was a struggling young kid. But in my mind, I was saying, oh, I'm this young entrepreneur. I'm building this life for myself that I want to live. And every day I would tell myself, like, you know, I don't have to work for anybody, so that's a good step in the right direction. And I just kept telling myself that and telling myself that. And I basically faked it until I made it, if that makes any sense. And, um, and then it just kind of evolved. And as I started, you know, I, I worked like a like a crazy person, right? I mean, I was up till two in the morning, three in the morning, four in the morning, writing articles, um, finding any job that I could on Craigslist. I mean, nonstop, I'd go to meetups, I would go to events, I would just literally anything I could do, I was doing it nonstop. And then slowly opportunities started to come up, right? Slowly I started to get projects. Slowly somebody said, oh, you know, you should write a book. And I said, oh, okay. And uh, I was given the opportunity to write a book. And then I was approached, uh, I got a column for Forbes. And then I started to get speaking opportunities and I would be able to charge for speaking. And then it just kind of more and more. And as it continued to build the house, more things came on top of that and more things on top of that. So it was just- That first book was about what? So my first book was, <laughs> it's a funny name. It's called Twit Faced. And it's, uh, it was about social media. It came out in 2009. And it was, it, was a, it was a very small book, paperback book, a small publisher that most people have never heard of. And that book was about how do you use social media. My first sort of, I guess you could call it a real book with a real established publisher came out in 2012. That was around collaboration. How do you use these technologies to get people to work together inside your company? And then after that, I wrote The Future of Work, which came out in 2014. And then after that, I wrote the Employee Experience Advantage, which came out this year, earlier this year. And it's, it's still, you know, every, every year I try to do something that makes me uncomfortable that I haven't done the year before. But tell me, uh, this path that you took, which is independent, which is your own uh, work by yourself, in Mexico, about 65%, two-thirds of population works for somebody, yeah. either government or private companies and corporations. The remaining rest are either professionals or they just work on their own, entrepreneurs, and whatever you want to like. What would you consider today is the situation in the United States and which of the two sides is trending or growing faster than the other? Mm. Are more people moving out of a fixed job, working for somebody else, into this kind of uh, adventure that you, 
decided for your life? What, what would be the trend and what is the divide there? I think it depends on your, your life situation and your comfort level. So if you're young and you're in your early 20s the way that I was, I think the best thing that you can do, you, you have two jobs. You have your full-time job that allows you to make money, pay the rent, pay your expenses. Get experience. Yep, get experience. And at the same time, you also have your other job. So I had two jobs for a long time, right? I mean, I was working 70 hours a week, 80 hours a week. So if you're younger, you don't pick one or the other. I think you do both at the same time. Okay. And you're young. So Extending you your working hours of the day or within yeah. your eight working hours? No, so you have your full-time you job where you work eight to five. And then after that, uh, you do what I did. And you would go uh, home and you look for other projects okay. on, uh, online. And you do other projects on the side. And you build, so you don't take one path, you build both paths. Let me ask you here then. Uh, today with Trump, uh, he's very, on a very conservative position, maybe obsolete, speaking about jobs as we understood them in the past, working for GM or working for Carbon Industries or working for somebody. And he's, uh, he's now putting all the drive and all the effort of the nation in rebuilding those jobs. Would that be a, a good thing to do? You think it's a... Oh, man. <laughs> or, or, or you should be creative. You should be promoting innovation. You should be promoting technology. You should be talking to people about what is coming next because those jobs, the trend is that they will disappear. Yes. Explore. Help me with this, with this yeah. thing. Don't worry about Trump. Trump is not going to see the program. So <laughs> please <laughs> speak, you never speak know. You the watch. truth. <laughs> so one of the things that worries me about the current administration is that they seem to not be aware of the technology aspect that you mentioned. Uh, I think the recent news and information from the White House, they basically said, we're not worried about technology. We're not worried about automation. At least for, I think they said 50 to 100 years. That to me is scary. Right? Because in 50 to 100 years, we're going to be living in a very different world. Right? We're already seeing automation happening now. So I, I think that they are very much missing. They're focused on keeping jobs in, in the United States and not giving them outside of the country. But they forget that even in the United States, you still have to worry about technology and those jobs being replaced. Uh, by technology. So they're very focused on one side of the equation, but they're missing this other side. And that's kind of what scares me a little bit, because you put so much emphasis on manufacturing jobs and coal and, you know, work for GM and stuff like that. But there's no discussion around, will these jobs be around in five years, in 10 years? How do we reskill you? What happens if these jobs get automated? What do you do? And those types of conversations are not happening. And that worries me a lot. And so that's kind of my perspective on the current administration. I think they need to do a better job of paying attention to how technology and how this new world that we're living in is going to impact jobs. And there doesn't seem to be much discussion. Even, even I would say not only, uh, you, you, we speak about objectively about the jobs, what they're going to be like, if they're going to be there, but mentally, yeah. <laughs> I mean, people, uh, um, What's going to happen with that? I mean, it's uh, still many people think about getting a job in, again, General Motors, and you're going to be there for life, and you will progress like it happened to me in Coca-Cola. I was yeah. concentrated in reaching the top of Coca-Cola. I didn't see to the sides. I didn't watch horizontally what was happening around me. And, uh, and that's because the culture then was that uh, in Coca-Cola, the, the, the highest level of uh, job was the guy that had more years in the company. Yeah. So the ones with 10 years were up to here. If you had 15 years, then here you became, <laughs> and then 20 years. And most of the people I met there had 30 years in the company. They were so proud, and the yeah. company was so proud also of keeping people there forever. I think that's off now. It, it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, I agree. And I actually like that you said that you didn't pay attention horizontally because that's one of the things that I talk about a lot and I call it paying attention to the tangential. So one of the best pieces of advice for, well, 
there are a couple good pieces of advice, I think, for individuals. The first is you have to learn how to learn. You know, we have always relied on companies and on schools to teach us everything that we need to know about personal or professional development. I don't think you can do that anymore. I think everybody watching, as individuals, you need to be more accountable over what you learn and the path that you want to build for yourself. You can't Let me hear a space because that's the profound change is being made by President Enrique Peña Nieto in Mexico on the whole education system. Learn how to learn. Yeah. Forget about what you are taught. Forget about uh, memory. Learn how to learn and be every day on that situation. Yeah, that, I, that's probably one of the best pieces of advice that you can give anybody because by the time you go to school, if you go to a four-year university or even three or five years, by the time you graduate, most of what you learn becomes outdated. And so if you just rely on what you learned, you're in trouble, right? So I, I, I love to play chess. Um, and it's, it's sort of like a chess game. You can't play a game of chess by trying to memorize the moves because eventually you get to a position that's new and you need to recognize, you need to learn as you're going along. And I think that the business world is very much the same way. So the first good piece of advice I have is learn how to learn. And the second one is what you mentioned, pay attention to the tangential. Uh, in the United States, at least, and in various other parts of the world, everybody always says, I'm so heads down. I'm sure you heard this a lot at, at uh, Ford and at Coca-Cola. Yeah. And the problem is that when your head's down, your head is in one direction. And when your head is in one direction, you miss everything else that's happening around you. And when you miss everything else that's happening around you, you don't, you know, you miss opportunities, you're not aware of how your job is gonna change. So I think today, you need to be heads up, heads side to side, heads around you. I mean, you need to be looking okay. all the time. Stop there, we're going for a break. Yes. And uh, because we're getting there now, this is it. <laughs> so right after we will, I'd like and love you to extend that. Sure. Gracias. Vamos a un comercial. del INEGI, en el año 2017 la tasa de desocupación en México fue de 3.5%. Se trata de una cifra moderada, sobre todo al compararla con otros países desarrollados. Desafortunadamente, los niveles más altos de desocupación ocurren entre la población más joven, sobre todo entre 15 y 30 años de edad. A su vez, las mujeres concentran la mayor tasa de desocupación desde los 15 hasta los 50 años de edad. Además del reto que supone el desarrollo tecnológico, la igualdad de género y las oportunidades para las nuevas generaciones, uno de los mayores desafíos para el mercado laboral en México es la informalidad. En 2017, 6 de cada 10 trabajadores estaban empleados de manera informal en México, la mayoría de los cuales no cuenta con seguridad social. Los trabajos que más serán afectados son aquellos que involucran actividades predecibles, como la elaboración de comida rápida o la operación de maquinaria. Por el contrario, aquellos trabajos que implican el manejo de gente, interacción social y un alto grado de conocimiento y experiencia serán los menos afectados. Aunque estos datos pueden parecer alarmantes, debe tomarse en cuenta que la automatización no ocurrirá súbitamente, sino de modo paulatino, por lo que no hay motivos para temer un desempleo masivo. Las transformaciones de la economía mundial serán sin duda un desafío en materia laboral. México deberá estar precavido ante los efectos del desarrollo tecnológico y la transición a economías digitales. Sin embargo, para Jacob Morgan no hay motivo para ser pesimista. Por el contrario, mientras sigamos poniendo atención en lo que realmente importa, las personas, está en nuestras manos crear un futuro promisorio. 
pero las decisiones para llegar ahí deberán ser tomadas en esta era de las definiciones. Jacob, uh, again, thank you. I think it's exciting this next 15 minutes we're going to have because this is what everybody needs around the world. What, what's coming next? What's the future? And this is interesting in Africa. It's interesting in Latin America yeah. and, and even more so on the vanguard, on those who are ahead. They have to keep discovering. They have to keep moving. There are very fatalistic uh, projections that nothing is going to work. What's going to be a world without jobs? Uh, what are we going to do we human beings? And the other one said, don't worry. I mean, it's a technology, <laughs> action, and, uh, and robots working for us <laughs> yeah. will give us a lot of time to do other things, exciting things. But please go into this world that is your specialty, that is what you really know about. I think the, so you're right, there, there's, there seems to be two, two sides that have been evolving. One side says everything will be okay, and the other side says everyone's in trouble. And what's really interesting is that both of these sides have access to the same information. Both of these sides are very smart, intelligent, PhD, smart people, and they both have very different conclusions. So the challenge for everybody is, well, who do you listen to? I think the best piece of advice that I can give is you prepare for both. Oftentimes, everybody always says, what's the future of work going to look like? And the problem with asking that is you assume that there's only one, you know, th there can be only one scenario, one situation, one alternative. But I think that there's going to be several different possibilities that can emerge. We don't know which one is going to happen, so you have to prepare for several. I think we will see some job displacement in some areas. I think we will see new job creation in other areas. So I don't think it's so black and white as everybody's making it sound. I think it's going to be a mix of everything. And as individuals and as companies, you need to be prepared for both. Now, I'll tell you the, the one really interesting thing that I see is on the one hand, we see a lot of research that says jobs will be automated. I think it's 47% of jobs can be automated over the next you know, couple of decades. Very scary numbers. Meanwhile, I speak with executives like the chief people officer of McDonald's, the head of innovation at EY, and the executives at the companies are not telling me what the research says is going to happen. So look at McDonald's, for example. McDonald's has been investing heavily in automation, in kiosks, where when you go to a McDonald's, you can order on a screen, on a, on a, uh, on a kiosk without a person. And so a lot of people see that and they say, oh my goodness, McDonald's is, you know, they're going to eliminate all the jobs. But when I speak with the chief people officer at McDonald's, he says, actually, we're not removing jobs. In some places, we're actually adding new jobs because McDonald's is going to switch to being more of a, a service restaurant where people come to you and they bring you your food and they ask you how you're doing. Another good example is Evian, the, the water company. Yes. The, you know, they bottle water, distribute it all over the place. They recently automated a lot of jobs in one of their manufacturing facilities. In that situation too, a lot of people said, oh, they're gonna replace all these jobs. Instead, all of these workers were retrained and instead of working on the manufacturing line, they now are, uh, they operate the automated shuttles on the plant. Mm -hmm. Another good example is at Accenture. Accenture automated 10,000 jobs, didn't lose any people. Instead what they did, and these were people in finance and accounting, they took these 10,000 people and they upskilled them. They trained them to be more strategic partners to their customers and their clients instead of people that just analyze numbers. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, I see stuff like that where a lot of companies are investing heavily in, and I've talked to different industries, to law firms. So I see that on one hand mm -hmm. and then I see the, the research on the other hand and it doesn't, it doesn't match up. So I think part of the challenge is that we need to understand that automating a job is not the same thing as replacing a human. As a human, you have many jobs inside of your company. You might be a doctor, and part of your job is to help diagnose patients. Well, if you use software to help you diagnose patients, that part of your job, that part of your, your work might be automated, but you as a doctor are still there. So I think we need to look at it a little bit broader instead of just jobs mm -hmm. and look at it. Now, there are some industries, for example, uh, truck drivers or people that work in logistics. 
where when we see an influx of autonomous vehicles, we might see some potential job displacement there. So I think it'll be in some industries, perhaps not others, but even in the areas where we have um, automated vehicles, we need to think, will other jobs uh, be created for those people? You know, maybe they'll still need to be in the car while the car is driving itself to make sure that everything is working okay. Maybe they'll learn how to maintain these automated vehicles or to program them or to configure them or to, or to monitor them. So we don't exactly know what the future is going to so bring. In this case, what, uh, what uh, you are suggesting is that the jobs very possibly are going to be there, but there's going to be different jobs and people have to prepare for or train for that different job. That, there will be one way to see it. I think we need to prepare for both scenarios. For both. So let's assume, for example, that a lot of jobs will be automated and replaced. You know, how do you prepare for that? Right? Learn how to learn, pay attention to tangential skills, take more accountability over your personal and professional development. Um, companies are partnering with universities. They're investing in training and education programs. And let's assume that we're not going to see a lot of automation. Right? So what do you do there? The interesting thing is that most companies, whether you tell them that they're going to be automated or not, the path that they take is the same. Right? They, don't, they don't change what they're doing. They still invest and partner with universities. They still invest in training and education. So the, even though we assume that there's different paths, the course, of, the course of action that we take is kind of the same thing. So we need to prepare for both. And uh, that's the ultimate way to, to think about it. We do this in our personal lives all the time. You're, I, I say you have to think like a futurist. In your personal life, when you think about buying a house or having a kid, in your mind you always think, well, um, what's gonna happen to the property value? What's gonna happen to the community? What, what should my child study when they grow up? I wonder who they're gonna marry. Like you think about different scenarios. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, when it comes to business, we don't think about different scenarios. We only think about one scenario. So I think we need to do a better job of thinking of multiple scenarios in the business world yes. and preparing for yeah. all of them. It's clear. Now, let me, let me uh, ask you this. I hear that some governments worried about this possibility of uh, less jobs or no jobs in the future. They are thinking about universal pensions so that everybody gets a basic income or salary and then you dedicate yourself to many exciting things that could be entertainment, could be music, could be traveling, could be creating, could be uh, being an entrepreneur. Yeah. Uh, that is also part of the solution to, or, or the way we should prepare for what is coming? I think we need to test and experiment and see if it works. I don't think there's gonna be one solution. Right? So universal basic income alone, I don't think is going to be a solution. I think the right approach is to think of many different solutions. Right? So if you assume that the future, there's going to be a lot of automation, it's not just universal basic income that you need. You still need education and training. You still need partnerships with you. Like, there are many things that you need to do instead of just one. You can't just give people money and say you're not going to have a job and assume that just giving people money is going to solve all the problems. Because a lot of people do work because it's meaningful, it's impactful, because they want to find purpose, right? So I think that one, one of the things that we need to do is do a better job of experimentation. I don't know if universal basic income is going to work. I don't think anybody does. But I think we're starting to see some experiments happen. But at the very, very end, in relation to wealth, if a robot is working for you and robots are going to be work, working for us, mm -hmm. persons or human beings, uh, so if we have somebody working for us, that's great. I mean, we still are going to be producing products. We're going to be, still be producing wealth through the robots. And, and I can dedicate myself to hire more sophisticated, more self-fulfillment uh, uh, self of, uh, of things to do. So the thing is, should be should we all be worried about what's coming and be frightened of that future? Or as you said, technology on one side, this uh, blend of uh, part aromatization and part is the added work to produce uh, 
Give us your final view of the future. What is the message for people here in Mexico, for people in the United States in relation to labor, to work, to entrepreneurship? So the scenario that you described of robots doing the jobs for you and you get to work on higher purpose stuff, I think that's an ideal scenario. But what happens when the robot breaks down? What happens if you have a farm that has a lot of automated tractors and robots and stuff like that, and those things break down or somebody hacks them? What's gonna happen to your farm? I mean, you still need to know how to be able to do these things. So, you know, there's a whole other issue. We, we paint this sort of utopian picture around, you know, robots are gonna work for us. You're gonna do all these wonderful things that you wanna do. But anybody that uses technology now knows that technology always breaks. There are always hacks, there's always security issues. And what's gonna happen in a world when we rely so much on technology? It's, it's kind of a scary thing to think about actually because you, you rely so much on a screen, so much on code, so much on software that you kind of lose sight of what reality is. Your reality is what you see on a screen. Your reality is the code that you interface with, that you interact with. And I think it's also a little scary for us to live in a world where we you know, put so much emphasis on technology and forget about the human aspects. So in general, to, to get back to your question, I'd like to think that there's gonna be a more optimistic future. I think we need to think of ourselves as working with technology instead of against it. And that is the, the best way to think about the future of work. It's not, I don't wanna think about humans versus technology, I wanna think about humans with technology. And I believe that as long as we have creativity, as long as we have imagination, as long as we have this drive to create, to build, that we will be able to come up and create things, uh, to come up with new jobs and to create things for us to do. But that's a choice, right? So we need to consciously make that choice to create, to build, to design, to think outside the box. The second you become complacent, the second you give up, the second you say, you know, why bother? My job is gonna be replaced anyway. That is the wrong mentality to have. That mentality will make sure yes. that you get replaced. Yes, you can't have that mentality. Okay, learn now, how to learn. Now, uh, that is clearly addressed to people, to individuals, to workers, to uh, employees. Now, for the corporations, what would be your message? Uh, companies? What should they be doing with human capital? What they should be preparing and building to the future in that respect? In that situation, I think um, and sort of the, the phrase I like to say is that every company in the world today can exist without technology, but no company in the world can exist without people. We have to remember that a lot of these technologies that we keep hearing about, AI, automation, robots, all of these things are built and created and designed by people. If your company still wants to exist in 20 years, in 50 years, if it wants to outlast the competition, you absolutely still need to invest in people. people. And I feel like a lot of companies are forgetting that. They're very focused on investing in technology, but if you have the best technology in the world and you don't have people at your company, your company's gonna struggle. So my big message and my big emphasis is technology is good, but people are better. Invest in the experiences of your people, um, we want to work for an organization where we feel like there are humans there, right? We're human beings. You have to build that kind of a company. So if you want to uh, survive and exist and outlast the competition, you still need to put people as your number one priority. Great message to And uh, Jacob, I really thank you for this uh, vision, information, and uh, and advice that you have given us. So thank you very much and uh, thank you. we'll see you there. Yeah, looking forward to it. <laughs> thank you. Gracias.